Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Dan Giba, a sequencing specialist at Illumina and commercial advocate for cell-free RNA profiling, the topic of today's video. I'm joined by Dr. Rohrbach and together we are really excited to share some of our research with you and hope you find this new method and application exciting as well. Let's start with some introductions. In order to appreciate the method we're about to share, let's take a step back and cover some basics. Every cell and tissue in the body has a blood supply and through various cellular processes, some are listed here, their contents are often spilled into that supply and shuttled away throughout circulation. By sampling blood using various techniques, including luminous sequencing, you can then analyze these contents and sample those tissues remotely, hence the term liquid biopsy. There is untold value in this method, not only from a detection standpoint, but also for standard of care as well. For those who are previously aware of liquid biopsy technology, you'd probably also likely agree this term is most associated with biomarkers related to DNA and usually in oncology applications. But one thing we want you to take away from today is that this is not the case. It is not just about DNA and it is not just about oncology. There are loads of other analytes currently being explored and utilized, including RNA, which is what we'll be focused on today. Okay, but why RNA? For that, if you indulge me again, let's take another step back looking at the differences between DNA and RNA as a biomarker. When you examine a cell's genomic makeup, DNA is almost entirely identical between every diploid cell, whether it be a neuron, skin, or even cancer cell. I say almost because somatic mutations can build up over time and under certain conditions cause issues. These somatic mutations are most notable in mutagenic cancer cells, and examining these mutations is helpful in classifying their subtype as well as potential treatment path. So applying this to a liquid biopsy is powerful, but it also means that you are sampling a massive amount of almost identical molecules looking for mutation events, some just a single base change, and often coming from less than 1% of total molecules. Many labs are doing this now, and successfully I might add, but there are some challenges and caveats that come with this method since a DNA molecule's origin is not identified by a sequence. Remember, all cells' genomes are the same. And specific mutations can help, but not always. Additionally, polymerase errors often get confused with very low frequency base changes and have to be countered with additional modifications and techniques. Lastly, DNA does not give you an idea of what those cells are necessarily doing, how they are behaving, or their state. And so this is where RNA comes in. RNA as an analyte can have some advantages. Unlike DNA, a cell's RNA transcriptome is different in dynamic between cell types, states, and under different stimuli. An RNA molecule sequence is unique and has a direct function. This makes them easily identifiable without some of the noise depletion techniques I mentioned in my previous slide. They also don't all exist by default. They have to be transcribed under certain conditions. This means that RNA signatures can also be used to describe how a cell is reacting, behaving, or a combination of the two. One great application well demonstrated in many other videos is single cell RNA sequencing. Researchers use cell specific transcription to identify a cell's origin, function, and state. With this data, researchers are building some fantastic cell atlas databases. These cell atlases are allowing us to further improve our RNA signature definitions and use these signatures to identify their origin and purpose. Do you see where I'm going with this? So let's apply RNA to a liquid biopsy. RNA sequences are dynamic from cell to cell and can be directly associated with their tissue of origin as well as function. So if you could sample them from a non-invasive blood draw and sequence them without the aid of noise depletion techniques, what could you do with such a method? Okay, now that we've done some introductions, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Suzanne Roback, to speak more about her and her team's research into cell-free RNA. We've come to believe that cell-free RNA has enormous potential to transform the field of non-invasive discovery and diagnostics. Cell-free RNA can be accessed from a simple blood draw and contains RNAs from all organs and tissues throughout the body. These molecules are released into the blood by two main processes. The first is cell death, where a cell is releasing leftover degraded contents into the bloodstream. 
and the second is active signaling processes uh, such as microvesicle shedding which contribute full length molecules. Due to these diverse origins and generation in real time, cell-free RNA reflects not only changes in gene expression, but also differences in signaling and the degree of cell death from all bodily tissues. In our recent Science Translational Medicine publication, we described how we established a robust end-to-end -end workflow that generates high-quality whole transcriptome sequencing data from cfRNA, and then applied said workflow in a proof-of-concept study that identified cell-free RNA alterations in early-onset preeclampsia patients. We started on this journey by asking, what does cell-free RNA look like? And we first saw that the amount of cell-free RNA in blood varies a lot from person to person, and it tends to be pretty low, about one nanogram of RNA per mil of plasma. Then we looked at the size distribution of cell-free RNA. Here we saw a pair of large peaks that are characteristic of full-length ribosomal RNA in a typical high-quality sample. In addition, uh, there's another population around 200 nucleotides that corresponds to fragmented RNA from cell death. And it's important to note that while this second peak is degraded RNA, 200 base pairs is definitely large enough for sequencing assays, and it's actually a little longer than the average cell-free DNA fragment size. Next, we wanted to identify a sample preparation workflow that would maximize the amount of transcriptome data that we could get out of cRNA. And as it turns out, if you generate a library from all the cell-free RNA molecules in plasma, you wind up sequencing almost entirely ribosomal RNA, which is shown as the gray bars in the graph on the right. And that's not particularly interesting or informative. So then we tested enzymatic depletion to remove the ribosomal RNA prior to sequencing library preparation. But here the outcome was unreliable. Most of that ribosomal RNA was gone, but yeah, there's an increased sample failure rate, and in some samples, they became overwhelmed by non-human RNA, which is shown as the, the pink bars in the top graph. And sometimes this non-human data would capture an infection, such as GB virus C, which is a common asymptomatic virus. And at other times, we saw bacterial species or potential byproducts of food digestion like breadweed. And while this diversity of information could be really useful in some applications, we wanted to focus on the human transcriptome in order to reduce sequencing costs. Finally, we turned to enrichment, generating a library out of all cell-free RNA and then using biotinylated primers to pull out transcriptomic sequences. With this approach, 90% of reads aligned to human exons, which is shown in orange on the bottom graph, while ribosomal and non-human RNA levels are consistently held in check. This allowed us to target 50 million reads per sample, which is much less than other approaches. And while we chose to focus on protein coding signal, it's important to keep in mind that this enrichment approach is highly modular, and it can be tailored to capturing any RNA species of interest, including non-coding or non-human RNAs. With a workflow identified, we investigated two additional variables. The first was blood collection tube type, specifically finding a tube that would be compatible with overnight shipping so that all samples could be sent to one location for processing. Here, we tested how well we could detect pregnancy-related changes after collecting samples in four different blood collection tubes and storing the blood overnight compared to blood that was processed immediately after collection. This graph quantifies the signal from pregnancy transcripts on the y-axis versus blood collection tube and pregnancy status on the x-axis. And although there is a decrease in intensity with overnight storage, the pregnancy signal was steer, still clearly captured in all conditions. We chose to use cell-free DNA struct tubes 
uh, as they allowed room temperature shipping and are already being used for NIPT testing. And in a further study comparing the transcriptome profile from a single blood sample processed after different storage lengths, we saw that transcriptome counts remained highly correlated as quantified by Pearson's correlation coefficient on the y-axis for up to five days of storage at room temperature. Then we looked at how plasma volume affected data quality and saw that biological noise, which you want low, was elevated when using less than two mils of plasma, while library complexity, which reflects information density and you want to be high, was far lower if we used 0.5 or one mil of plasma. So we chose to use four mils of plasma for the remaining work in this study because this corresponds to the amount obtained from a single 10 mil blood draw. We tested our final workflow on a cohort of longitudinally collected samples from 41 healthy pregnancies and identified over 150 transcripts that are altered during the course of gestation. These are shown in this heat map, which has gestational age increasing from left to right. Most alterations displayed an increase in transcript amount starting early in the second trimester, which appears as more orange. And these transcripts reflect changes in a spectrum of gestational processes spanning placental, fetal, and maternal systems, including trophoblast differentiation, embryonic morphogenesis, hormone regulation, and the onset of labor. But most affected transcripts are expressed by placental tissues, shown as blue and green in this pie chart, and our successful and sensitive capture of placental and fetal RNA is emphasized by our ability to detect Y-chromosome transcripts in male fetus pregnancies, even at the earliest time point in the first trimester of pregnancy that we tested. These combined findings gave us confidence that our cell-free RNA workflow could be applied to characterizing pregnancy complications. For that task, we focused on preeclampsia, abbreviated as PE, which is a relatively common complication, affecting 4 to 5% of pregnancies worldwide. This disease is characterized by an abnormal vascular response to placental development, and people believe that this goes wrong really early in gestation but disease symptoms don't show up until a lot later, after 20 weeks of gestation. Preeclampsia has a range of manifestations, and we chose to focus on early onset preeclampsia with severe features, which shows up earlier in pregnancy and has an increased risk of poor outcomes. So we set up a clinical sample collection to create the Illumina Preeclampsia Cohort, or IPEC, which is comprised of 40 patients at the time of diagnosis with early onset severe preeclampsia and 73 gestationally age match controls. We also obtained independent samples from the Pearl Biobank to serve as a validation cohort, which consists of 12 early onset and 12 late onset patients. For both cohorts, uh, you can see in the bar graph that the collection criteria captured severely affected women as nearly all early onset preeclampsia subjects in blue and pink delivered prematurely. We found 30 transcripts that were differentially expressed in the IPEC cohort. And in this heat map, you can see that this cell-free RNA signature accurately clusters the preeclampsia samples uh, shown in blue separately from the gray controls. And the majority of the affected genes have elevated expression in disease. Two thirds of these transcripts are expressed by placental and or fetal tissues, and they encompass a huge range of biological processes that are known to be impaired in preeclampsia, including placental development, fetal growth, and maternal cardiovascular and immune system dysfunction. Even more exciting, we saw that the transcripts that are altered in IPEC were capable of accurately clustering the early onset preeclampsia samples in the independent Pearl cohort, which suggests that our CFRNA measurements are really capturing the underlying molecular changes uh, characteristic of this disease. 
In contrast, these transcripts could not distinguish the late onset preeclampsia samples from Pearl at all. And this is consistent with some suggestions that uh, this form of the disease may have a different molecular mechanism of onset. Then to formally test how well cell-free RNA can detect early onset preeclampsia, we developed and trained a custom Adaboost machine learning classifier on the IPEC cohort. And this classifier worked really well when tested on samples that had been withheld from all model building activities. The IPEC holdout samples were identified with nearly 90% accuracy, 88% sensitivity, and 92% specificity, with the Pearl early onset preeclampsia samples close behind at 85% accuracy. And although the Pearl late onset preeclampsia subjects again had lower classification performance, they were actually still categorized with 80% specificity, which indicates that our model identified alterations that are highly specific to the disease state. 49 transcripts were selected for use in model building, and again, most showed elevated expression in preeclampsia, just shown as there being more orange towards the right side of this heat map. 24% had also been identified as differentially abundant, 39% are expressed in placental or fetal tissue, and these transcripts continue to represent a broad diversity of biological functions. Though, interestingly, we noticed that there was an increased proportion of maternal uh, impairments, specifically uh, immune regulation transcripts, that were used in Adaboost compared to the changes detected in earlier analyses. The IPEC dataset was generated several years ago, and since then we've continued looking for ways to improve the cell-free RNA workflow. Our original protocol utilized the TrueSeq Library Preparation Kit, which is a ligation-based approach, but the RNA Prep with Enrichment Kit previously known as Nextera Flex, was just finishing development uh, as we wrapped up the earlier study. And this RNA prep uses bead-linked transposomes, which give it the advantages of being simpler, faster, and higher efficiency than TrueSeq with the same content flexibility in enrichment. So we reprocessed some of the IPEC samples through this protocol to see how well it worked on cell-free RNA. Comparing the two datasets, we immediately saw that the new RNA preparation detected more transcripts than TrueSeq, which we believe is due to the increased conversion efficiency, uh, which allows the capture of more low abundance molecules. Not only that, when we plot transcript abundance against dataset noise, we see that the noise is substantially decreased for low abundance molecules, which are circled in red, when using the transposome kit. And finally, differential expression analysis identified 15 transcripts as altered when using either the RNA prep or the TrueSeq protocol, but also five that are unique to this new RNA preparation. And critically, three out of those five were below the limit of detection when using TrueSeq, which means they couldn't even be assessed at all with that method, uh, despite the fact that they turned out to have biological connections to preeclampsia as they're involved in regulating uterine blood flow and embryonic development. These results show that the Illumina RNA prep with enrichment is a more streamlined protocol, which also offers higher sensitivity measurements while including more low abundance transcripts. Throughout the course of this work, we identified a robust workflow to generate whole transcriptome cell-free RNA datasets. We discovered a cell-free RNA signature that captures the dysfunction of diverse body systems and accurately classifies preeclampsia status across independent cohorts. And we've shown that the next generation of RNA prep kits enable even greater sensitivity and throughput for the next wave of research. Our findings illustrate how cell-free RNA can monitor maternal, fetal, and placental functions in real time, 
which could be a key enabler in identifying and monitoring the molecular underpinnings of pregnancy complications and other complex disease. And on a personal note, this is the coolest data set I have ever worked with. The depth of information that kept connecting back to the underlying biology was truly inspiring. And I genuinely am looking forward to seeing how cell-free RNA applications evolve. With that, I will turn things back over to Dan to talk about Illumina's role in enabling further studies of cell-free RNA. Thanks, Dr. Rohrbach. What a fantastic story discovery. I hope everyone enjoyed hearing that. I'm back again to close things out, and I pose the question, where can we go from here? We hope through our talk, you are able to employ a new tool of discovery of cell-free RNA. And just food for thought, if you look at the CDC top 10 causes of death, eight can be contributed to organ disease or failure of some kind. What circulating RNA potentially brings is a view into the transcription of all organs, and not just for the detection of a disease, but also the state and progression. This could lend to further discoveries in translational research areas like cancer, neurological conditions, cardiology, infectious disease, and many more, really any systemic progressive disease. And as we've discussed, our newly revised RNA prep with enrichment technology is uniquely positioned for cell-free RNA analysis, thanks to its rapid and easy to use workflow, exceptional performance with intact or degraded samples, perfect for cell-free RNA. It's scalable with up to 384 unique dual indexes, and it's flexible. You can use any content you like or even go as high as the entire exome. As we come to a close in today's video, we at Illumina want to reiterate again how excited we are to share this workflow with you and the potential benefits, not just from a perspective of scientific discovery, but also because we are able to enable it from start to finish with a library prep that's highly compatible with cell-free RNA right out of the box. Illumina RNA prep with enrichment has an easy workflow and is customizable in content. Additionally, cell-free RNA has reasonable sequencing recommendations that put in the realm of all labs with access to a NextSeq or NovaSeq system. This leverages the best-in-class workflows and quality you've come to trust from Illumina. And lastly, tools in our cloud and offline analytics platforms for secondary analysis of RNA data, and even help with the creation of machine learning models with our newly launched Illumina Connected Analytics platform. If you are interested in learning more about the cell-free RNA workflow, please contact your local sales specialist. Or if you don't know who that is, call our customer support line and they can direct you. Thank you for all that you do and happy sequencing.